So I will tell you the thing, Romans 12, one and two has been, when I used to have life verses, that those two <laughs> were verses that I really, really clung to. And your description of them on Sunday was absolutely fabulous. It just, it just brought so much light and so much freedom for me because I never quite got out of the bondage of the spiritual service yeah, yeah. kind of thing. And so to understand how you tied it back with Galatians 2, just, it just was, it was wonderful. I just sat here with my jaw on my lap watching yeah. on Sunday morning. It was so cool. It's good stuff. Yeah, well, it was good stuff. <laughs> and then it makes so much sense when you see it. Oh, yeah. I was like, well, now that verse even means is, you know, more powerful and more meaningful. Yeah, it's like if you want to consider yourself a living sacrifice, you would just do like, Paul. Oh, I was crucified with Christ. It's yes. no longer I who live. It's Christ who lives me, yeah. lives in me in this life. I live now in the flesh. I live by the faith of God and not the faith of man. And that you've considered yourself a living sacrifice, sacrifice. Yeah, right. because you're still alive. Yeah. But now you've considered this the old man dead. Yeah. Right. That's right? your sacrifice. Yeah. 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 No, that's so powerful. Yeah. So very, that. very powerful. I love that. And it, it's really easy to see when you read verse two, because verse two is a is a is an expounding on verse one. Mm -hmm. He says even even and we see we see and and so we think it's an addition. Right. But it even and then he explains. What a, what a living sacrifice. Even, be not conformable to the wisdom of the world. Right? right? Yes. That's what it would mean to consider yourself a living sacrifice. See yourself as crucified with Christ to the wisdom of the serpent that's come into the world. Right. That says you are what you do. Right? Consider yourself crucified with Christ to that wisdom. Yes. That you're defined by what you do, what you get, what you have. And then when you say it's no longer I who live, it's not that Greg no longer lives. It's not like there is no Greg guy now, and there's just a Jesus bobblehead now, you know, <laughs> superimposed over me, and that Jesus bobblehead is now living for me. It's that this, it's, it's that Greg lives, but the life Greg lives now, he no longer <laughs> lives by the wisdom in the world, but he, he lives by the faith that came in the person of Jesus. Right. So there's a persuasion or a faith that came in Jesus about who and what I am, and what the Father thinks of me, mm -hmm. and now I live my life in that world. The life I live now is Greg. I no longer live by the word in the world in the, in, about my life, but I live about the word of God about my life. Right? right. Yes. Does that yeah. make sense? So God's got yeah. a word about who and what I am. Yes. And now I walk in that word. I know the world also has a word about who and what I am. And I don't walk in that word anymore. I don't try to be justified through the, the good I can do and the bad I can keep from doing. I don't try to... I don't try to create an image of myself by my works that can be so beautiful that when I look upon it, it tells me, ah, you are a son. Yeah. Right. right. I no longer live by that, but right. I see this guy, God, when I didn't even know he was my father, he come and told me he was my father because he called me son. And this guy said, he's done something to create me in an image that's so full of glory and honor that should I walk by the image he's revealed about me, I'll find myself strengthened in the inner man with peace and love and joy and kindness. Right. And so in living sacrifice, we were all laboring and toiling to create ourselves in a good image. And he come and did what we couldn't do for ourselves. Right. right? Yeah. He come and died away the, the thing we were busy with, and he raised up an image of us we can now walk in. Yes. And now that's what we live by, his work yeah. right. to create us yeah. as sons and daughters. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. You know, the other, go ahead. Go ahead, Viola. Today, I was listening to um, a message by Greg from 2014. And something he said, it just really hit me. Um, in uh, 1 Peter 1.23, it says, Being born again, not a corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And when you said it, I just put you on pause and meditated on that. And for the first time, I could see that that incorruptible seed is the word of God about my life that never changes. Yeah. Right. 
that was just like I had never seen that before. The, and, and so then I thought of Colossians 3 where it says, if you be risen with Christ, um, set your affections on those things which are above. And that thing that is above that I am to set my heart on is Jesus Christ seated at the right hand of the Father. And that is God's word about me. Yeah. Yes. And it's just like, oh my goodness, God's word about me can never change because he's unchangeable. And yeah. so if our heart is set upon that, our reality is that, then uh, our life is born from that. Yeah. But w w if, we, if we get blindsided and start looking at ourselves or our performance, that's corruptible. Yep. And so the only safe place to stay is in that reality of what God says about us. Amen. <laughs> You know, th this is this is shocking for people to contemplate. Um, but even Jesus, before he took the sin of the world upon himself, mm -hmm. had a body that was corruptible. Mm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Even He's apart from, human. Even apart from him having sin uh, and death, yeah, yeah. should he have believed on the life that he had, even in the world, apart from having sin and death on him, that life was still corruptible. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And what we don't realize, every aspect of the life that's in this world that we could have, it's subject to corruption. Mm -hmm. And should our eyes get set on that, or our hope, or our affection, what happens is it'll make our hearts sick. It'll leave our hearts sick because it can never satisfy our hearts with an incorruptible life. Right. Around every turn, it's still corruptible. Even the life Jesus possessed in the earth, before he took sin upon himself, that life was able to be corrupted. In the flesh that he had. That flesh died, did it not? That means it was able to be corrupted. There you go. Now, the life he possessed inside of himself, the, the seed that came from the Father, the Holy Spirit, that life was incorruptible. And see, he didn't believe on the life that he had in the world, though, that was corruptible. He believed on the life he possessed in himself that he knew he came from the Father. And his hope was in the life he had in himself, not in the life he could have in the world even in a body that had no sin yet, even before it had sin. Right. So that's the life that did not see corruption. Right. Yes. Okay. Right. Yeah. That'll trip up people. <clears throat> it's a hard thing to think about. Yeah. We can just go and think about that. Because I think sometimes we're in this world so much. I mean, we're in this world as much as you could be that it's very easy for our affection to get set on the life that's in this world. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and even Jesus, though, apart from any sin, the life he had in this world was still subject to corruption if you're just looking at his body because his body died. And I say it that way, and maybe it's just me, but I was taught Jesus couldn't have died until he took the sin, oh. meaning that if they had gotten him and tried to like saw him in half, they couldn't have done it. Oh. And when I go back and look at the scriptures, I don't find that to be a valid way or accurate way of describing it. Because there's times where he floated through the crowd because it wasn't time yet for him, mm -hmm. right? Where he evaded the crowd. And if they couldn't have killed him, then he wouldn't have been trying to evade the crowd, mm -hmm. right? He'd have just been like, oh, you can't kill me. Catch me if you can. <laughs> yeah, Catch me right. if you can, sucker. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Dude, go ahead, you know? <laughs> Sticks and stones, right? right. <laughs> wow. I never even thought about that. That's amazing. Yeah, so that's the, the, the being made not conformable to the wisdom of the world. It can help all of us out to know that when sin and death entered the world by Adam, then a word entered the world about human. Yes. Right. A word entered the world about human. And that word comprised a belief about human that was based on what you do, what you have, what happens to you, your accomplishments, what other people think of you, your money. It, it, all those things, that word compiles an image about you. Right. And then that word about human was made flesh in all people that were born from Adam on. Meaning we beheld that word, thought that word was the truth about us. Mm -hmm. And then that word began animating human beings. Mm -hmm. And that's why they find themselves now laboring and toiling for life. And because they're laboring and toiling for life, they find themselves with murder, envy, hatred, 
gossipy, backbiting. Mm -hmm. Because if you enlist the flesh for life, life doesn't dwell in the flesh. The flesh can't produce any good thing. So if you enlist your members for life, it's only going to produce the fruit of death. Mm -hmm. And so what God did was he said, let me now interject my word about human into the earth. My word about human, they can be whole. My word about their life. And should they be persuaded of my word, then my word will be made flesh in them and animated in them. And then what happens is part of the word of God about our life is this word that's in the world isn't true. And that's why the crucifixion, Jesus died unto that word. There was a world in the world about Jesus's life as he hung on the cross dying. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a good word, was it? No. I mean, you can go read the people's accounts. It wasn't a good word that was in the world about Jesus's life. Well, that's the same word that was in the world about all of our lives that we were believing on. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. Guess what? If you've seen Jesus, you've seen yourself. Right. Amen. It isn't just if you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen yourself. And I don't mean that you're the Messiah or that you're the Logos. I mean the word made flesh in Jesus about humans. Right? That mm-hmm. was made flesh in Jesus. So it's, if you've seen the Father, Jesus, you've seen the Father. But also if you've seen Jesus, you've seen yourself. Mm-hmm. And then what happens is if you can see the Father's word about your life and then realize that's the only truth, then what happens is, is in your heart you consider yourself dead to the other world. That's right. See, Jesus hung on the cross, and so what they say? You're the forsaken of God. You're, you're naked. You're worthless. You're the biggest disgrace that's ever come along in the history of Israel. You're the biggest disgrace that's ever come along in the history of humankind. I mean, as good of the things, as good of all the accomplishments as Solomon was, you can look at Jesus and say he had the most negative report of anybody that's ever walked the earth as he hung on the cross. But see, he didn't lift one finger to change that report. Right. What he did was he considered himself dead to that report. He presented himself a living sacrifice. And then on behalf of human beings, he died unto the word in the world about his life. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is God came and raised him up unto the word he had about Jesus's life so that he could do all of that on behalf of all people. And now we could experience the same thing in our hearts where there's been a world in the world that's come against all of our lives, Mm -hmm. pointing at what we have, what we do, what's happened to us, what people have said to us, what they've done to us, what they think of us. And now when we behold ourselves in Jesus and we see him die to the word in the world about his life, in our hearts, we die to the word in the world about our life. We see that that word isn't the truth about our life. And then our hearts consider us dead to it. We consider ourselves crucified with Christ. Right. It's no longer I who live, it's Christ who lives in me. I no longer live according to the word in the world about my life, but the life I now live in the flesh, I live according to the word of the Father about my life. That's what he's saying there. Okay. You know? That's really important. And that's what the gospel is designed to do, yeah. is to say, listen, there's only one word that's ever existed about human. Jesus. Jesus. That's the only word that's ever existed about human. Now, we were in darkness. We were lost. We couldn't see what God saw in his heart. If we could, you know what we would have said? We would have said the same thing Jesus said. We would have seen the sin and the death in us, but we would have said, nothing can move me from the Father having called me son of And so I'm not going to lift one finger. And see, we would have died in the flesh. Sure. But you know what would have happened? God would have come and raised us from the dead. Yes. <laughs> See, but Adam couldn't believe that, right? Yeah, right. And so Jesus yeah. had a revelation of the word of God about his life. Yeah. And now we can be made partakers of that same thing through Jesus. So Jesus considered himself a living sacrifice. Mm-hmm. He said, that word that you guys are telling me about my life, I consider myself dead to it. So much so, I'm not going to lift one finger to change it. Right. And then he died unto it, right? Yeah. He died under that word because he was raised up free from all of that. He was raised up in glory and honor and revealed to be the son of God. How was he revealed to be the son of God? The guy died and he's alive again. (laughs) God can't die. He's an immortal. So Jesus was raised up in immortal. 
So now we know that guy's come from God because God was the only immortal. Now we see another guy that's immortal, and he's in a human body, and he's come to testify to us of the Father and what the Father has always thought of us and what the Father intends to do with our life. You want to know what he intends to do with your life? Look at what he did with the life of Jesus. That's what he intends to do with your life. And now I live by that promise and the view or the beauty of his thoughts for me. I see the beauty of his thoughts for me, and I see the integrity of his promise to me. And now that's what I live this life and this flesh I have now by. Right? So when something tries to come and tell me, are you really the son, Greg? Look at, see, I'm a living sacrifice. I consider myself dead to that word and alive to God's word who says you are the son. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm. You see, that's an example of how that looks. Right? I'm not coveting a good report anymore. I see the good report that I always coveted about my life, that I thought I had to fight and labor and earn to get. I see one has come on my behalf, and he has established an incorruptible report about my life in Jesus. He come and did for me what I always desired to have. We all desire a good report. Sure. All right? Well, God's come and give us one in Jesus. Stop, work, stop working. He's like, you see this thing you've been working all your days for? Chill out, man. Watch. Behold what I've done to already establish a good report for right. you. Right. Just behold the report of your life in Jesus. No, but i got to do something. To do. <laughs> you know, in Hebrews 11, 1, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And, you know, when we see Jesus as the faith of God, we can look at him and say, he's everything that I ever hoped to be. And that's who I am in him. Yep. Right. Yeah. That's exactly you know, I, in another message I was listening to today from 2013, you said another thing that hit me. I love it when I get a nugget. And, you know, it's fresh and seeing it through totally different eyes than whatever I saw. And you said um, you gave the scripture in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 17. It says, and if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. And you said, you know, if ever you look at yourself and you feel like, oh, my goodness, you know, I'm in my sin, the proof that you're not is that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. Yeah. You know, he couldn't have raised from the dead if he didn't leave off my sin. That's and right. so just the fact that he's raised from the dead, that's proof. And this scripture is saying it. If Christ be not raised, then your faith is in vain and you're yet in your sins. Yep. So the fact that Jesus is raised from the dead is evidence that I'm not in my sin. That's right. 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 That's the, and that's actually the place you're supposed to reason from. Because things will try to convince you that, you know, you're in sin. Mm-hmm. Things will, accusations will come against you. You might find some infirmity in your body or in your thinking. You could feel weak. And all those things are trying to convince you that your sin and death is conquering you. Right. See, but God come to give us a different place to reason from than what we see in our lives. So if I want to reason about whether or not I'm in my sins or whether or not I'm still in bondage to sin, I don't look at my own life. I don't look at what I see going on in my own life. I look at the resurrection of Jesus. Right. And now he is the interpreter of my life. And that's what most people don't see about what God did. He came to give us a different place to reason from about our life instead of looking at ourselves. And now we reason from Jesus. And that can accurately interpret our lives for us, and it can bring peace. If I'm stressed out thinking I'm in my sin, am I in my sin or not, how do I know? If I see Jesus in the resurrection, I see he's free from sin. And I see he's my high priest, which means he's the representative of me. As he goes, that's telling me that's how I go. And so I, I see there's no sin in him in the resurrection. I see he can never die unto sin again. And then that now interprets my life for me. And it puts me back to rest. I say, ah, okay. I'm not in my sin. I'm not being conquered by sin and death. Jesus has conquered sin and death. Here's how I know. And that's the word about my life. Like six, John yeah. six. 
think it's John 6, 28, right? As he is, so are we in this world. Yeah. Boy, you grab hold of that. An, another word that I was thinking on as I was meditating on the fact that we're what is it? born again from an incorruptible seed by the word of God. And it brought me to think on uh, John 1, where it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And I stopped and thought about that, that everything that is, is brought about by the word of God. And so God had a word about us. And as our hearts are persuaded of that word, it's like our lives are being built by that word. As we come into agreement with what God says about us, we're blossoming into the truth about what God says. That's right. But you can only apprehend it. You can't labor for it. You can't do anything to add anything to it. Is all you can do is allow Jesus to persuade you of the truth that already is. And as you come into agreement with that truth, that truth is manifested in your life. Thank you. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And, let, and lest I lead any of you astray, my wife has corrected me. It's 1 John 4, 17, and not John 6, just so you know. I thought I'd let that go. Yeah. <laughs> There's only a couple of There's only a couple that I really need. <laughs> hey, that's one of the best ones to know. Amen. And, and we, could, we could say it like this. It's in, in the beginning was the word of God about humans. Right. Oh. Right. Yes. In the beginning was the word of God about human. Yeah. And that word was face to face with God. And that word was God, meaning it was what God thought. And the word of God about human was made flesh. Mm. The word of God about human was made flesh. We're, I mean, we're, we're all, we've all, and I don't want to say us all, so I'm making a general statement about the world. But in the world, most people think that God doesn't like human. Right. Exactly. That God kind of just tolerates human. You know, because he has to, because after all, he is love. Yeah. You know, well, after all, I am love. I guess I have to tolerate these guys, even though they're kind of, <laughs> they, it's like a distaste. It's like in the Matrix when the robot guy, and they have him on the, the truth serum, Lawrence Fishburne, and he's sweating, and the robot goes and grabs it. What is it about you? <laughs> That's right. And then he basically <laughs> equates him to a parasite that takes over the whole world, and he talks about how disgusted he is with human. That's kind of like what we thought about God. Mm -hmm. And now God had to come and do something so that he could stand to be around us. Yes. And that's kind of how we viewed it. But, you know, um, I love what Arthur Manchus says in his series that I gave Billy, and Billy will get to it. But it, it, the series is called Who is Man? I encourage everybody to go listen to it. It's a great series. And at some point, Arthur gets all lathered up. He gets to the end of the stage. God likes human. That's right. <laughs> you know? And it's like that is just mind-boggling to so many people, that God likes human. That God had a good view and opinion about human. He didn't have a good view and opinion about the death they were dying. Right? right? Yes. Two different things. Right. He had a good view, of, just like my parents, when I was overdosing on drugs, they still had a good view and opinion of me. They didn't have a good view and opinion of the life that was manifesting in me. Mm -hmm. Because that life was killing me. Right. right? So God always had a good view and opinion of man. He didn't have a good view and opinion of the life that was manifesting in them mm -hmm. because it was killing them and it was mm -hmm. keeping them from face to face with God, which is what he always wanted. Right. So we look at what makes God happy and unhappy based on his desire. His desire was that man would be face to face with him for all eternity and they would never feel fear. They would only feel love. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what got blown up? That whole, right. that whole desire. Right. So what made God unhappy, is, and this is how we, we think of it so much as uh, um, faith pleases God, and, and, and we don't look at that the right way, but what, would, what made God unhappy was that man couldn't stand in his presence without feeling scrutiny or without a heart that was blaming them. Right. And so he was unhappy with that. Right. Now, does that sound like God's unhappy with people? Yeah. But we look at it as God's unhappy with sin. 
And we never qualify that. He's unhappy with sin because should iniquity dwell in a human being's heart, that iniquity will cause the human being to blame themselves or find fault with themselves in the presence of God, which will keep them from standing in the presence of God. Right. So that's why it would make God unhappy. Yeah. We have this as like a behavioral thing. Oh, their behavior is bad, and now I'm angry at their behavior. No, no, no. no. I'm displeased that I can't have face-to-face -face the way I always wanted to with my kids. Right. Yeah, I've been, I've been thinking about that. They've been thinking about Christmas and how people portray the, the coming of Christ as part of Christmas, focusing not so much on his birth here, but focusing on the cross and how twisted that gets because they don't understand just what you explained, the intent of the Father's heart, yeah. that he, he sent Christ to earth for multiple reasons, one to show us who we are, but the other is to divorce us from that system that was that was killing us. Yeah. yeah when you look at the, the Christmas story, it, yeah. you know, him coming as a babe in a manger, you know, peace on earth for the that that beautiful story of this child coming for us communicated something from God's heart towards us. And it, 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 it's a simple, beautiful story. That's why it's so endearing to to every, everybody I know in this country and people all over the world, it's an endearing story. Now, they haven't taken it the step further to, to understand that this meant salvation, even though they sang it in the Christmas song. Right? Yeah, but, but, that's right. But, yeah. you know, it, it's, it's a clear indication to humanity that God loves you. Yep. But they just haven't taken it the whole way. That's exactly right. That's kind of what I'm, I think I might talk about tomorrow when I do a little Christmas video. Oh, good. We, we, we see the, and I love Luke too, good tidings of great joy, right? And we think the good tidings of great joy is just in the fact that a Savior was born. Right. Right? But it's now, now listen, we can all be happy that a Savior was born. Because listen, even if I just know I'm being saved from death, I can be very happy about that. Mm -hmm. But the power to experience the good tidings of great joy is found in the heart of God in sending a Savior. Right. You see, yes. and see what we've yes. done is we yes. strip the power of the great tidy or the good tidings of great joy because we neutered the heart of God in sending a Savior. Right? Yeah. We we've stripped the power, but you know when you go read that that the de the Greek definition of that word at the end of where is it? Where's my iPad? Let me just get the verse so everybody can read it for themselves, and I'll probably mention this tomorrow if I uh, figure out how to talk to a camera with no people there and, <laughs> and, and act as if I'm talking to people. It's a struggle. The, and the angel saw what happened here. The angel saw so much more than what the people than what people see there. They knew something. <laughs> God just became human. Okay. God just became God just became human. That says something. About, said, this is good. That's yes, right. Good. Yes. And that says something about the heart of God for humans, even while they're dead in their sin. You see, we've stripped that from the whole message. Oh, a Savior's coming. That's it. Well, we can all be happy that a Savior. I was happy just to know I could be saved from sin and death. But I found good tidings of great joy born in me when I realized what it meant. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, good will towards men. Now, you realize when the angel said this, Jesus hadn't died on the cross for anyone's sin yet. Right. Nobody had believed on Jesus yet. Right. No one had believed in the spirit of grace. Now, look what good will toward the angel says. I see this incarnation of God into human flesh. There's only one way to interpret this. It is that goodwill has come from God towards people, people who are dead in sin. These people weren't holy or right. right. Nobody had believed. All had fallen short. Now look what goodwill towards men means, man. Delight, pleasure, satisfaction, desire unto someone for you, you, you're, you're, you're longing for them because they're absent. Meaning that you delight wow. so much in them wow. that it produces a longing in your heart for them when they're absent from you. Now, this all speaks to the motivation of God's heart in sending a Savior. And so long, in the, so for so long in the Christian church, we just talk about a Savior having come. And we strip the heart 
of God behind the Savior coming. Yeah. Because we've all still been living by the word in the world about our life, mm -hmm. which is that we suck. <laughs> <laughs> Look at us. Yeah. We're worms. Yes, right. We, we couldn't even, I mean, even though the scriptures clearly say it, the angels said it. It wasn't even a human there that said it. The angel said, I see that God has incarnated himself into a human being. That can only mean one thing, that God delights in human. God finds pleasure in human. He finds satisfaction when he looks upon them. And his desire, he delights so much into them that he desires them. And he has a longing in his heart to be with them when they're absent. And because of all that, he's come with the Savior. See, now when you start understanding the heart of God behind why he sent a Savior, now you start experiencing the season to be jolly, mm. right? Now yeah. you start feeling happy. That's when the soul can feel its worth. It's like, oh, holy night sense. Right. Yeah, yeah. The soul begins to feel its worth. And it's critical to see that God felt all these things about human beings even while they were dead in their sin. Even while they were dead in their sin, it says he had delight in them, mm -hmm. that he found pleasure in them, that satisfaction, that he had a longing in his heart for them, right? Basically, what it means is God identified with man. God looked at man and saw himself in them. He said, these people are my kind. Yeah. He identified with them to such a degree that he found this is the place where I will rest. This is the place that I call home. Right? Home is where the heart is. Right. Man is his home. God came and said, identified with man so much that he became a human being, forever declaring that his desire was unto man, that he longed for them when they were absent, that he found delight and satisfaction and pleasure in them, so much so that he wasn't willing to let them perish, but he came to conquer their death so they wouldn't perish but have eternal life. Amen. And then when you start living from there, you start getting happy. That's good news. That's really good you news. You start realizing your value. Yeah, absolutely. And then you start thinking like God thinks about. You know, when God thinks about humans, you know what happens? He gets a big smile on his face. <laughs> so when you know what God, you know, when you know what God thinks about human, you start to think about human the same way God does. And then guess what happens? You smile also That's right. when you think of human. That's right. And not just yourself. You smile when you think of other humans. Then you begin appreciating things about other humans, their little intricacies, their little habits, the little things that you do. You, you no longer feel aggravated about them, but you find beauty in them because you find authenticity in them. You find blessing in them. You find God in them. You start identifying God in them because you see God identified with human. And then when you're looking at human, man, you're busy realizing I'm looking at the God kind. This is the God kind. I'm not looking at just like any kind of a being. I'm looking at the God kind. God has come and claimed these humans as his own. He's come and said they're mine. Yeah. They come from me. These are my people. Amen. I'm glad you explained that, Brad. <laughs> because for about three years now, you talk about we're the God kind. And I'm thinking to myself, what the hell is he trying to do? <laughs> That explained it. Hallelujah. There you go. <laughs> yeah. we're, 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 we're the kind of That's being, good. the kind of being that we are is the yes. God kind. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's the kind of being that we are. And so when you begin thinking about yourself like God does, you begin to see the beauty in human. And listen, God makes a point to, to, to say all that before Jesus had even died for our sin. Mm. Because he's trying to declare, it's never been that I was dissatisfied with who you are. It's always been I was dissatisfied with you dying, man. Right. And so I've come to do something about your death. I didn't come to change who you are. I came to reveal the word about human that's been from the beginning. God's no. word doesn't change. No. He didn't first have a word about human, and then his word changed, and then it changed back. No, he's always had the same word about human, but Satan found a way to interject his word right. about human into the earth. And man began walking by the serpent's word instead of God's word. And then that brought forth the serpent's life, right. which is what God said Satan was a murderer from the beginning. And then they took it. A lot of the translations changed that verse 14. And like this one says, glory to God in the highest, highest heaven. They say, and peace on earth to all those pleasing God. 
Yeah. And it's like, oh, what? really? They just change it up to make oh, it look so not all inclusive, you know, and not that that God is well pleased with man. You're right. Yeah. With all those who please him. Yeah, what that's what it, translation is that? That one is uh, TLB, but there's several yeah. of them like that who have changed it up. King James got that one pretty good, really. Yeah. And, and that's why I like the King James. The way it words it can make it difficult to read it. But I find it the easiest for me, at least, to go back and look at the original Greek and piece it together with the right. King James. It's the easiest, yeah, right. and, and that's what I—that's what I usually go do. See, I was um, at my mother's this weekend, and the pastor preached a beautiful message, but had that translation. I'm like, what? You know, I'm like, wait, hey, wait. Hey. But that's a perfect example. Of what we're talking about the carnal mind can't wrap itself around what God believed. How good it is who believed about human because we confuse the identity of man with the life that was manifesting. That's right. In man. Exactly. And God never did that. God never confused who we are with what we had done. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. When I was dying on the hospital bed from the drugs and overdose and they had to, they had to bring me, resuscitate me. My parents were never confused about who I was. Mm -hmm. My parents were never like, this ain't our kid. That's the best example. They're not our. This, he's not going to go look at them because. Yeah, no, right. Yeah. They, they never had that thought because nothing could change who I was, right? Right. But they found great dissatisfaction at this life I was experiencing. Mm -hmm. The death you were experiencing. Right, because it was killing me. Yeah. Right. Because they loved me. Yeah. Right. So how could God be happy with us dying? He couldn't be. So God was unhappy with the death we were dying, right. and He said, "I'm going to come and do something about this death they're dying." And he's thinking, and man, if I get so happy when I think of them, then imagine if they can think about themselves the same way I do. They'll be a happy people. They'll, they'll just be happy, and they'll just be free. No, they'll feel such contentment that they won't be fighting with each other to steal and get ahead of one another. They'll just be so content with who and what they are that they'll find themselves just enjoying life, just yeah. being content with whatever lot or place they find themselves in at that time. Right? Yes. You know what's funny? Even even hearing that verse, I mean, translated that way, like when you understand grace so much, you still smile. And you're like, yeah, he says I'm pleasing himself. You can still see the good. <laughs> <laughs> it's so yeah, yeah, you can always be excited. That's right. You absolutely can. And so you can see how simple the gospel is. The gospel really is a simple message of how you've always been beautiful to God. You've always been um, his children, um, but you you've been sold in, under slavery to right. sin and death. Right. And because you've always been beautiful to him and you've always come from him and you've always been his people, he's now come to destroy the thing that's destroying you on your behalf. Mm -hmm. That's the simple truth, right? Mm -hmm. And it takes really smart people to complicate the whole thing. <laughs> Right? right, and then we got to spend the rest of our time unwinding all the complicated things the really smart people brought into it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> because we can't look. You can't even just go into church every day and say God's always loved everyone. No. God's only ever thought everyone was beautiful. Right. You can't even just go into church and make that blanket statement without people. What did you hear, with Brother Chris? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously? Oh yeah, I know. You're absolutely. But right. the Bible says that God loved us with an everlasting love. I Meaning it never changed. It's perpetual. Everlasting means without beginning or end. Now, if we want to say man is evil, will we say God loved evil? No, we won't say that. Well, then how can we say man is evil if God loved man with an everlasting love? You can't. No, you can't. No. But what we've done is we've equated man and evil as one. Yes. Yeah. And we say, that's our plight. We're evil. Mm -hmm. We have to be saved from being evil. Listen, we're not trying to like be saved from being a vampire. It's not like you know Count Dracula has come and infected us all with vampirism. If we can get the main vampire to die, then none of us will be evil anymore. He didn't come to save us from being evil in that sense. He came to save us from death because he saw us as a treasure. And ironically, the Bible even says the treasure in the field. The kingdom of God is like a man who found a treasure in the field. And when he found the treasure in the field, he sold everything he had in order to buy the field. I hate to break it to everybody. We're not the ones who sold everything we had to buy the field. That's not talking about us. 
That's talking about God beholding all of us in the field and seeing that we're a treasure mm. and seeing that we're so valuable. The only thing that can equal our value is him. So the only way he can purchase us or redeem us back from the system of sin and death unto himself is if one of equal value to us comes as us and for us and now dies us away from that system. So he bought the treasure in the field. We're the pearl of great price. You're the pearl of great price. That's why God sent his son to purchase you back from sin and death. Jesus is the, man, whatever you want to call it, but Jesus is the price that the father paid for the bride. Mm -hmm. Yes. And And the father determined what the bride was worth. Mm -hmm. And when he determined what it was worth, he said, man, there's only one thing that can actually meet the payment. It's if I come in the flesh. That's the only thing that can equal their value. Why? Because they're my kind. They come from my loins. They've been cut from the rock. And you don't hear that as part of the Christmas story. <clears throat> but it's a key part of the Christmas story. It, it's you know, huge. In, in, key part. In, in 2 Corinthians uh, 5, 19, it says that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Now that word reconciling means to exchange something of equal value for something else. So that's what was going on in Christ. Um, Not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled back to God. And so the ambassador is supposed to be saying the same thing as the king or the kingdom that he represents. And this is saying, listen, God found you so valuable that he exchanged Jesus' life to buy you back. Now you go out and tell the world how valuable they are. Yep. And you know, the church is not doing that. The yeah. ju- I mean, for years I went out and on the street and I told people how bad they were. <laughs> I said, you know, you are a dirty, rotten sinner. And unless you turn, you're going to burn. <laughs> church and Christianity because it's not good news. It's not good tidings. No. It's bad news. And it and it blasphemes the name of God yeah. to people. Yes. Is what it, it, right. it, it creates a caricature of God. Yes. You know, like if one of the artists down in the French Quarter yeah. could just paint a caricature, yeah. when we come with that word about God, it creates a caricature of God that isn't real at all it's a false image of god and it's one of the reasons why jesus had to come to reveal god for who he really was and what he really thought about people because we couldn't see it now what do we see in jesus do we see jesus disgusted to hang out with sinners nope no we see jesus sitting with them eating at a table with them which in the jewish culture is signifying union you don't go eat at a table with somebody in a jewish culture Unless you're declaring equality and union with them. You're basically identifying with them to such a degree that you're declaring to all the people you're with them. Yeah. Family. Friend. Family. Yeah. Right. And, and that's one of the reasons why the Pharisees were so angry that Jesus was eating with, with the sinners. Because they couldn't fathom that. If, certainly if anybody come from God was going to sit with anybody and be with them. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Right. And he come and blew up that whole thought process. And he did that to um, what does Ezekiel say? He came to uh, man. What does he say about God's name? He came to sanctify the name of God. Mm. Meaning we all had once we had a negative view of ourselves. You know what we thought? 
Certainly, he must have same, the same view. Same thing. Yeah. That's what First John talks about. Right. If my conscience condemns me, then I know God is greater than my conscience, and so certainly he must have the same view of me. So once Adam thought he was a miserable worm that was just a worthless loser, and that he thought God thought that about him. Right. And so the name of God began to be blasphemed in the hearts of people mm -hmm. and in the earth. And so Jesus came to sanctify the name of God by revealing the truth about God's thoughts and intentions for human, even while they're dead in their sin. Listen, man, this is what God comes to say. Listen, I see you in sin and death. That sin and death isn't, it hasn't come for me. This is what I intend to do. I intend to come and raise you up out of that sin and that death because I love you. Just trust me. That scripture in uh, Ezekiel 36, 22, it says, Therefore, say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the heathen whither you went. And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which you have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. Wow. And who is Israel? Jesus. I've been talking about this a lot, but yeah. that is God talking with Israel, but there's also a part of that that's revealing a hidden aspect of the Father and the Son oh, wow. talking. Right? Wow. And so the heathen would know when God would sanctify his name in Jesus. How did he sanctify his name in Jesus? He came and revealed the way he deals with somebody with all sin and all death in him. Yeah. And what did he do? He was yeah, only good and kind to that guy. Yeah. And that's John 17, Jesus praying to the Father. Mm -hmm. In that I have authority over all flesh. Glorify me and I am, that I might glorify you. Meaning that when God come and raised Jesus up from the dead, that would now sanctify the name of God in front of everyone. And he sanctified his name in us. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Amen. Wow. And do you see how that sanctifies his name? Yes. Because we're absolutely. busy thinking we can't trust this guy with our life because look at this sin and this death we have. Look at this body of death we have. This guy is against us. He's the one bringing the death to us. We even attribute the sin and the death that we had to him. Right. He's the one doing this to us. He's the one bringing the curse. And so we couldn't trust him. And so what God and the Father and the Son and the Spirit said, we'll take all sin and all death, everybody's sin and death, Jesus will take it into himself. He'll become the image of man dead in sin. Then God will come and show the world that he's not the bringer of the sin and the death. He's the savior of the sin and the death. So they'll see he's the one who saves from sin and death, not the one who gives death. And then they'll see the way he intends to respond to a person in sin and death. You know what that tells every human being that's in sin and death? I can call out to that guy. And that guy will preserve my life. Yes. Because I see he just did it. Yeah. Now he becomes sanctified in my heart as the savior of men, yeah. not the bringer of death. Right. He's not the thief. He didn't come to steal, kill, and destroy. But man thought God was the one bringing death. And even today in churches it across yeah. the world, they'll preach on Easter that God took his wrath out on Jesus at the cross. But the whole idea was to demonstrate there that God's the bringer of life, not death. Mm -hmm. That's the whole idea going down there. You want to know what brings death? I know you're confused. I know you think God brings death, but sin brings sin, death. Right. It's sin that brings death, not yeah, God. Right. You want to know what God brings? Look at the resurrection. Now you see that God brings life. Yes. God didn't give the death to Jesus. Doesn't it say that Jesus took the sin of the world upon himself? Now, does the Bible say the wages of God is death? It says the wages of sin is death. Right. What did Jesus take upon himself? Sin. sin. Is there any verse that says Jesus took the wrath of God upon himself? No. Is there actually even a verse that says that? No. No. Well, where do we come up with this stuff from? Carnal mind. The carnal mind. Yes. Get busy concluding. Because that's what we would think needs to happen. Sure. What's our idea of justice? Revenge. Yeah. <laughs> our no. idea of justice is revenge. Vengeance. And so if a wrong is done, our idea of justice is now we're going to go get that guy. And then we attribute that onto God. 
And we feel like God has now been offended by our sin and our death. And he had to find a way to get his angst out so that he could be delivered from his offense. Right? Yeah, that's the carnal thinking. Absolutely. Yeah. And so then we describe what come upon Jesus at the cross as the wrath of God, but nowhere does it say that. It says no. Jesus took the sin of the world upon himself. The Bible says over and over the wages of sin is death. So then what would bring the death of Jesus? Sin. sin. Not God. Right. Did yeah. God Adam? No. no. The tree brought death to Adam. And but we see, and this is just a picture of the way we think. So God come to sanctify his name. In him is no darkness. That means there's no death in him. Right. In him is no death. In him is no death. Right. Therefore, he can't be the cause of death. Go back to Sodom and Gomorrah. Right. Right. Too. He yeah. cannot be the cause of death. He can only reveal death for what it is. Yes. That's yes. the only thing he can do. Yeah. Go ahead, Beulah. In Isaiah 53, <laughs> It says he is despised and rejected of men, not God. Yeah, right. Despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with, with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. You know, it was man's rejection of him, not God. Yep. Right. He suffered the wrath of man, not the wrath of God. That's exactly right. It, it, it even says we esteemed him smitten and stricken of God. Right. So first, exactly. The next verse it says, surely who forsook him. And then we said it's God. Yes. Right. <laughs> Which is the Adam mind. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's yeah. the self justification. You blame someone else, right. right? Yeah. So we're the ones who forsook Jesus, and then we blame God. <laughs> God, surely. <laughs> God has forsaken him. You know, the prophet says it right here in Isaiah 53, 4. He says, surely he hath, uh, uh, wait a minute. Uh, yeah, surely he hath borne our grief and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. So he, you know, the prophet is saying, you know, we thought he was forsaken of God. We thought he was getting his just desserts because he blasphemed God in saying that he was the son of God. Yep. But that was man's opinion. Yep, absolutely. And I don't mean to sound like very like anal, but I'll do, I'll go there. Is I still wouldn't say it was the wrath of man because I would say we were animated by sin. I wouldn't say it was the wrath of man because there's a little a different teaching out there that said it was the violence of man. So I wouldn't connotate it to the same thing. I'd say because we were animated by the sin and God, he, Jesus said, forgive them. They don't know what they do. You know, because we were innocent in his eyes. We were being animated by a system that was killing us. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah. just to be technical, sorry. <laughs> and listen, sometimes there's good, there's good cause to be technical. I don't have any problem with what Beulah said from the foundation of nobody having been exposed to that other teaching. But in light of what Dawn's saying and that yeah. thing they teach, it, right. it would become critical yeah. sure. in that explanation yeah. to, to say that. Yeah. Because then the whole thing becomes skewed. Right. And then like the whole thing becomes, oh, God came to save man from their wrath, mm -hmm. you know, and, instead of God come to save him from death. Right. And then the whole thing gets perverted. Sure. So what Dawn says is very valuable and true because right. people do get confused mm -hmm. about right. that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you, Dawn. Yeah, so pretty much it's like people uh, in their hearts what, through the heart of mind thinking God is, you know, hates, you know, whatever happened, like, they, they think Jesus was in sin, blah, blah, they think, uh, oh, that okay, this is what he's doing, you know, God hates that kind of stuff, so surely, you know, he ate with the sinners, blah, blah, blah. you know, they, they're pretty much seeing the, how, I mean, they're pretty much seeing, like, uh, okay, the wrong thinking of uh, God hating them, and they're putting that in front of him, like, yes. he yes. hates us, he definitely hates him, too, yeah. right? so it's like, <laughs> That's exactly right. They're actually beholding themselves in, in that thing. 
what they mm -hmm. Jesus be the only reason Jesus become marred like that on the cross is because that's what sin had done to all of us in our hearts. Right? He entered into our history. Right. He didn't enter into a new history altogether. He entered into our history mm -hmm. to reveal it for what it actually was. And so we, we, we struggle to see, I say this all a lot, but J his story is our story. Right. He, and we couldn't accurately interpret our story. Right. We looked at our story and we come out with the wrong conclusion. The conclusion was we're the forsaken of God and he's going to kill us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the conclusion <laughs> was we're not the sons and daughters of God. Mm -hmm. uh, we're something else. And now we got to labor and toil. That was the conclusion. And so, Jesus entered into our story so that we could see God interpret our story. And then we could see the accurate interpretation of our story. And then we could live by that, which is, yeah, man, we were in bondage to sin and death, but God had never forsaken us even while we were dead in our sin. He was all the time loving us with an everlasting love and with an everlasting kindness working to gather us to himself. He was all the time doing that. He was all the time telling us how he would clothe us with his glory and his life. And we didn't need to do it ourselves. And we couldn't see it because we thought we were the deplorables. Right? right? Yeah. To quote someone famous. We, we, we thought we're deplorable. That's right. We're unredeemable. All our hearts are abundantly wicked. There's nothing good about us. How can this God possibly want to save us? We better get busy doing it ourselves. And so Jesus enters into our story so we can see our story from the outside looking in. Doesn't everybody agree that it's much easier to understand someone's story if you're watching from the outside? Sure. You know, like, well, somebody's in the midst of a problem. It's easy for me to be on the outside and kind of see what's going on and then explain it to them. But when I'm like in the midst of the storm, sometimes the fog is thick for me and I can't interpret it right. But a friend can come along and be like, Greg, man. Yeah. And they can interpret. That's how it was for all of us. We're like in this thick, dense fog, unable to interpret our story. God's on the outside looking in. He's not in darkness. So he can come and interpret our story easily and perfectly and reveal it to us. And the way that he does is he comes as a human being and then takes our life onto himself so we can see our story in him and see how God has always come to be with us, yes. even in the midst of all sin and all death. He, he takes us out of the fiction area of the library and he moves us to the non-fiction yes. area. <laughs> and then you have saying, glory to God. Glory to God. Amen. <laughs> and that, that's one of the means of glorified. It means to reveal the truth about someone. Yes. So Jesus says, I am the last Adam. That means I'm the representative of the entire human race. I'm the high priest of the entire human race. Mm -hmm. Part of that means I have authority over all flesh. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what Jesus says, if I'm the representative of the entire human race, Father, the time has come. I'm going to take the sin and the death of the world to the cross. Glorify me. Reveal the truth about me. Then that will reveal the truth about what you believe about all people because I'm the representative of all people. And then that will reveal the truth about you to all people when they see what you come and do to me while I'm dead in the grave. They'll no longer say that you're the bringer of death, but they'll say, truly, he is the savior of man. Yes. Amen. Right? Amen. And then they begin, we all need salvation. Yep. So then we begin trusting in the guy that is the savior of man. Instead of thinking he's the bringer of the death. I mean, even in the insurance policies, right? An act of God. Right. <laughs> It's in every really policy. Wrong. It's, really wrong. <laughs> it's intertwined in everything. It is. It absolutely is. is. It's, that's yeah. some of the most beautiful verses in all of the Bible is Jesus praying in John 17. And he's praying as the high priest. I have authority over all flesh. Mm -hmm. So when glorify me, reveal the truth about what you believe about me and how you intend to manifest yourself in my life when I, I'm found with all sin and all death. And then that will reveal the truth about you and what you believe about every person and how you intend to manifest yourself to every person. And then they can see it. And then they can believe on you, Father. And then they can be one with you, even as I am, am one with you. And I and you and you and me and I and them and them and you and you and them. And, and he goes, you know, into that whole thing about you. Yeah. This is how it's going to happen. Right. Well, you know, you get, 
You indeed. <laughs> or at least I get happy. I get happy. <laughs> Gracie's wagging her tail. <laughs> Gracie's happy. Gracie's groaning yes, in travail right. waiting the right. manifestation of the sons and daughters of God. <laughs> oh. oh, man. <laughs> so all that from the Romans 12. Morning. That's right. <laughs> Presenting yourself a living sacrifice. It's got nothing to do with you serving in some aspect of the church. Right. It's got nothing to do with you performing or taking up some office or service in the church. That doesn't mean no one will. It just means it's got nothing to do with it. When you guys start at the home group, mm -hmm. did somebody tell you you needed to do it? Nope. Did somebody tell you you need to present yourself a living sacrifice and you need to start performing this, this ministry? No. You just felt a desire, right? right? So you were strengthened by faith with grace to do this because you had a desire for it. And that's how everything in the church is supposed to work. Somebody will feel a desire or a passion to do it, and then they'll want to do it. Mm -hmm. And they'll do it from passion and desire instead of obligation and compelling. Right? right? It's like the notes. I don't, I don't, exactly. I don't do the notes because I feel compelled to do notes. Exactly. I do the notes because it's a desire to do that. Right. So guess what? The Holy Spirit can actually knit us together in love without us telling people, you must be knit together. <laughs> the Holy Spirit can actually do it. He can actually do it. Right. It's amazing. It's, it is amazing, isn't it? It's amazing. The Holy Spirit can actually do it. Uh, no, uh, even sometimes in our own church, we have like, I want, I want to say this funny experiment going on. And it's only like a funny experiment. Maurice and I talk about it because it's like you never really seen this go on anywhere. But we're actually just going to let God do whatever's going to happen. That's a funny experiment. Right. Yeah, and, right. And, <laughs> and we're just going to see what, what God's going to do. But God actually possesses the ability to knit us all together in love. Yeah. And I think sometimes people come to the church and they, they, because they still have some way of thinking about how church was, they can think that Greg's driving the vision of the church. I ain't, I'm not trying to drive any vision. My idea of church is I love to reveal Christ Amen. in people. Yeah. And so all I want to do is do that. And then what I hope to see happen or what I'm believing God's going to do is that other people are going to feel a desire to do something mm -hmm. inside the same fellowship. And they're going to start doing it. And see, so, so now we're not driving a vision. We're just all coming together and doing what we love and what we're passionate about. And the thing fits together that way. That's right. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. And then that's how our joy can't be stolen. And we don't end up thinking, oh, I'm working this job. I got to do it. <laughs> that's right. Which is how church turns into. <laughs> yeah. When they tell you, what ministry are you going to perform, brother? Yeah. Have you taken the personality test yet? Yeah. <laughs> we got to plug you in somewhere. We got to get you going so we can bring forth the vision of the pastor. Yeah. <laughs> and that's an odd thing because I think a lot of people sometimes in the church, it's almost like they're waiting for me to drive what we're, I'm not going to drive anything. <laughs> You, you know, I'm doing what I love to do. Yeah. And now I just want everybody else to be free to do what they love hey, to man. do. That's and right. man, I'm inviting them. Come do it with us. Yeah. Let I'm us here. do it together. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Amen. Someone was going to say something, I think. Um, not this past week, but the week before. Um, somebody got up and spoke in church and he was talking about how he would try to become strong by praying more or reading his Bible more. And he realized that he was trying to become strong so that he wouldn't need Jesus. And, you know, as I listened to him, you know, it reminded me of the manna in the wilderness, how they had to pick the manna each day, sufficient for that day. But these people were so afraid of doing without that they picked more than they needed. You see, they didn't want to have to depend on God tomorrow they wanted it, you know, in their hand. They, you know, it, it's fear. And I got so much out of that because I stopped and I thought about it. And I realized that we were never created to be independent. Yep. 
We were never created to fend for ourselves. And yet the carnal man tries to heap up and store up so that he doesn't need anybody. He doesn't need to depend on anybody. And it's so anti-Christ. And Jesus showed the way that he lived. He says, you know, I of my own self can do nothing. He was totally dependent upon the Father. And uh, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul, he wanted, he didn't want this thorn in the flesh. And then the Lord said, you know, Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in your weakness. And when Paul got it, he said, I will therefore glory in my infirmities. I'll glory in my weakness, for that's when uh, the, the power of Christ is in my life. For when I'm weak, that's when I'm strong. Now, if we're strong, when we realize that we're weak, then we're weak when we think we're strong. Right. We're actually weak when we think we're okay and I can handle this. I can do this. And the Lord reminded me of a story in the book of Joshua when they came into the land of Canaan and they were kicking butt all over the place. And the Gibeonites heard that they were here and they were like, man, they're going to get us. So we've got to feign coming from a very far land. And they put on these really ragged clothes and they put stale bread in their saddlebags. And then they appeared unto the Israelites and they said, oh man, we've come on a real long journey, you know? And they said, you know, will you make a pact with us? And the scripture says, now look at this. They, the Israelites, they didn't confer with the Lord, but they looked with their physical eyes and they said, well, we can see these guys have come from afar. And it says in verse 14 of chapter 9, and the men took of their victuals, they took of their meat and asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. And then they find out the next day it's their next door neighbor. But because they made a pact with them, they couldn't destroy them. And what did the Lord say? He said, you know, destroy them all. But they couldn't because they had entered into a pact. And it just makes me think. You know, when it says they, they sought not the Lord, it was referring to going to the high priest and inquiring of the Urim and Thummim. That they, it was the go or no go of the Lord, whether they should do something or not do something. And you know, the Lord said, he said, when the Holy Ghost is come, he will lead you and guide you into all truth. The Holy Spirit is our Urim and Thummim. He's right there. He's our go, no go. And he says, you know, when my husband used to fly in, if all the lights was, I think they were green, you were right for landing. But if the lights were red, you're either too far up or too uh, close to the ground. You had to go around again. And so our go and no-go in the Holy Ghost, the scripture says, let, let the peace of God rule in your heart. And that word rule is to be your umpire. And so, you know, when you're going to do something, if the waters are troubled, it's like, wait a minute, I need to stop and inquire of the Lord about this thing, because you know what? We should feel that peace 
when we're going to enter into something or do something. Sometimes you just get that check in your spirit, you know, something's not right, you know, and if you don't have peace, you don't need to make a decision at that time. And that just blessed me so much that the Lord brought me back to that story. It's so important that we be led by the Spirit. Yeah, yeah. That was my little brother. Yeah. That said that in the, the thing. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's true. We think when we feel weak that that, that means there's something wrong with us. We do. But no, there's nothing wrong with us because we weren't created to find strength from ourselves. So if we feel weak, it just means that we are thinking that we are find, supposed to find strength from ourselves, right? And so we can't be out of luck at that point because we weren't created to find strength from ourselves anyway. So if we feel weak, it doesn't mean there's something wrong with us. It means that, man, we were just created to find strength from God and not from ourselves. And so what God come to do and what God did with Paul, what did he say? My grace is sufficient. For, you know what he said? Your sufficiency is my grace. <laughs> right? So what God comes to do with all of us is we think weakness is a negative sign or a negative mark or an indication something's wrong. What God comes to do with all of us is cause us, when we consider our own sufficiency, uh, we don't think of ourselves, but we think of his sufficiency as our own. Right. So when I feel weak, even should I feel weakness, my heart would gravitate towards him as my sufficiency. And then even when I'm weak, I'll feel strong, right? And that's what, what, what Jesus was saying to Paul. My grace is your sufficiency, not whether or not this thorn comes or goes. Right. Paul was busy thinking his sufficiency was if the thorn could go. My sufficiency for all to go well with my ministry is if this thorn could be dealt with. Lord, if you could just take care of this, man, I'll evangelize the world, I yeah. promise. <laughs> And then God's like, no, 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 man, Paul, oh, man, your sufficiency to deal with this, it isn't found in, in yourself. Your sufficiency is of me. We, we are strong. Right. Who told you you were weak? Right. We are strong when we realize that without him, we can do nothing. That's you right. can't get any stronger than that, than to know you're weak. And a scripture that the Lord just uh, gave me in uh, 2 Corinthians 13, 4, it says, For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. Yep. Yep. It's just what we said. It's just what we said. It is good. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Thank you, Viola. That was good. Glory to God. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions about Hebrews 6, since that was technical, and we threw that in at the end? About losing your salvation? Yeah, about whether or not a person <laughs> well, can lose their salvation. I don't, I don't really have a... Uh, question about it but i gotta tell you i wasn't in church and i watched the video and uh you did a good job with that oh, i mean what's neat about you know the, the ideas and concepts that you know you discuss in religion like can you lose your salvation is you know everybody's got an opinion some people believe you do and some people think you don't well the way you presented it which was so good was that you presented the truth contained in the Word of God that communicates to us the reality that you cannot use, use your salvation. So you leave it up to the hearer to make his own decision about that. Yeah. You know, you didn't say, get up and say, no, you can't lose your salvation. It's not, uh, that's not biblical, you know. Right. And people believing things because some man told them. You understand? Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's different leading people in the truth, you know, contrary to just telling people what to believe. What to believe. Absolutely. Right. They can come to their own conclusion. And they can the come truth. to their own conclusion. And yeah. it's actually easier for a lot of people that way, especially if they've espoused a contrary view. Yes. If they've already espoused a contrary view and you just come telling them, like Marie said, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible doesn't teach. Exactly. That may be true, but they're not going to hear it. Right. Right. Gonna, it's just, it causes empathy. Right? Yeah, it causes empathy. 
But when you just present the case, now they're thinking on it with God. Right. And now they're going back over what, what was said there. Yeah. And then it becomes a, a belief or a seed within them that yeah. can be expanded on and grow. That's a good but, but uh you know, otherwise it's just really superficial, you know, this is what I believe and this is what he believes, you know. Yeah. Exactly. And those verses are very sounding. Yes. The yeah, way right. they're yeah. the way they're worded. And you you really you really can't understand what's being said there unless you're you're factoring in the whole letter of Hebrews. You you have to understand what he was saying before, what he's saying in chapter nine or ten. Mm -hmm. Because notice he goes on and says, For it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to purge your conscience from sin. Right. In fact, it can only serve as a reminder of your sin. It's the same thing he's talking about in chapter six. They they were like when you sinned under the Jewish system, you would offer your offering. And then that would be your remission from the sin. Sure. That would send the sin away from you. It would be like your conscience being purged from sin. Mm -hmm. But what, what the author of Hebrews comes and says, it says, let us move on from that system of animal sacrifices for the remission of sin. And let us move on to perfection, which is to see we've been sanctified once for all time. For it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to purge our conscience from sin. And in fact, all it can do is serve as a reminder of our sin over and over and over and over and over again. So he's equating two systems there. And that's why it goes on to the long thing. For it's impossible when a person has tasted of the kingdom that's to come and has the Holy Spirit. And all, you know, it runs down the whole list of things. Sure. A person in Jesus. It's impossible in the system of faith. Should Greg fall away? Because that would be their, their response. Mm -hmm. Well, what do you mean, man? What do we do then when a person falls away or when they commit a sin? Yeah. What are we busy with now if we don't do that? So it's impossible in the system of Jesus for a person to be renewed again unto repentance through these animal sacrifices. You can't renew a person to repentance. So if Greg falls away from grace, you can't now bring in the animal sacrifices <laughs> and offer them right. and think that's going to renew me back to grace. Yeah. It's not going to do anything. Right. And in fact, if you do that, that would be really acting or turning your back on the only thing that could renew me back to repentance. If I've fallen away from grace, that means I'm now trusting in my own strength for life again. Sure. The only thing that could renew me back to the grace at that point is if someone can come and tell me about how I was crucified with Christ to a life through the strength of the flesh. And I can say, oh, you're right, man. I can't be justified through my own ability. That would renew me back unto repentance. Yep. See how it is in the animal sacrifice. Right. So he wasn't saying it's impossible for them to be renewed to repent, repentance, period. It's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to renew anybody to repentance, is what he's saying. Yeah. It's impossible for that system to renew anybody to repentance because that system can never purge my conscience from my works. In fact, it can only serve as a reminder to me that I must live by my works. But the blood of Jesus, we know, can purge my conscience from my works, can it? Because I can behold myself crucified with Christ to try and to attain the life through the strength of the flesh. Then that purges my conscience from my works, right? And then I'm renewed again unto repentance. Now, that was the first time that I saw that where it says, if they shall fall away, and it just hit me, fall away from what? Fall away from grace. Yes. If, they fall, if you fall away from grace, there's no other way, there's no other system that can lead you back to a change of mind. It's okay. only the truth that is in Christ. And, you know, you said, you know, if one should fall away, they need somebody to come and tell them and get them back into the truth. And the scripture in uh, 2 Timothy uh, for, uh, chapter 2, verse um, 24, it says, The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. 
that to oppose themselves is to set oneself opposite. They're self-condemned, so they're setting themselves against themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, that they may recover. See, this is somebody that has just got, you know, darkness has come over them because in order to recover themselves, they had to have been in a right place in the beginning, but got deceived by something, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. So when someone is overtaken in a fault, they don't need a Christian to go and tell them how bad they are. <laughs> they need to go and remind them, you've forgotten. You've forgotten who you are. You've yeah, forgotten that you were cleansed from your sin. It'd be like if I thought I could, if I could be cleansed from sin by going to a priest. Yeah. and confessing my sin to him. Right. And I was doing that repetitively. And even after believing in Jesus, I found myself, the author of Hebrews was here, and he could write a letter to me when I was busy with the Catholic thing when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And I thought I had to go to confession. The author of Hebrews would write something very similar as he wrote in chapter 6 there to, to, the, to the Catholicism. Sure. He, these guys have believed in Jesus to some degree because they say he's the son of God. Right. But now they're busy with all these external things, thinking those things are what get them forgiveness or renew them to repentance or renew them to the remission of sin. And he would write and tell them, let us move on for that, for it's impossible for all those things to renew you again to repentance should you fall away. Right. Those things can't renew you. Yeah. So if you find yourself where you think you've fallen from grace, where you think the, the life of Christ isn't manifesting in you, listen, the only thing that can renew you at that point is the message of how you were crucified with Christ mm -hmm. and you were raised from the dead with Christ. That's mm -hmm. the only thing that can. And that's how they would move on to perfection because they would stop looking at all the animal sacrifices and their mind would become fixed on the once for all time sacrifice. Amen. And that's what the author of Hebrews was busy trying to do. And we completely discount that. It, the, the context has nothing to do with the person gaining or losing salvation. It has nothing to do with it. It has to do with these guys hadn't entered into God's rest. They were still busy trying to renew themselves to the remission of sin. Mm -hmm. And he, that's why chapter 4 talks about there remains a rest for the people of God, a rest from their own works to be sanctified. These guys hadn't heard the word of righteousness yet about what God had done to sanctify them. Yeah. So they hadn't entered his rest. They were busy every time they committed a sin working these things. And so the author of Hebrews comes in, and he's trying to bring them into that rest. The way he's trying to do it is to get them to lay that stuff down. The way he tries to get them to lay that stuff down is to tell them that stuff you're busy with, it's weak. Yeah. It's feeble. It's impotent. It can never renew you to repentance, even should you fall, find yourself having committed a sin or having fallen away. That stuff can never renew you. Mm -hmm. A lot of the church today, what they do is if you feel like you've fallen away from something, they say you're backsliding, and they have you go up and profess or confess your sin. Recommit and yourself. Recommit yourself, which says, I'm going to try harder. Right, mm -hmm. right. I'm going to work harder. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to get it more. Right. And that's exactly. the same thing that's going on. That's why you see the same that letter on back every week. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and, and, and really what that does is is that puts the blood of Jesus to an open shame. Yes. Because and we'll just use first John. If I think I have to confess my sin every day yeah. in order to be forgiven, what this actually what I'm saying is what Jesus did did isn't enough. And so now every time I sin, he's got to come back down and die again. He's got to die again. He's got to die again. And so in this old system, guys, we continuously perform sacrifices in this system called faith that is revealed in Jesus. In that system, there's only one sacrifice. And it doesn't happen repetitively. It doesn't need to be offered repetitively. It doesn't need to occur repetitively. Once for all time. Once for all time. Once for all time. And that's why he goes into such detail about that in chapter 9, chapter 
10, chapter 11. That's why he hammers that whole thing home. He's explaining to them. He's In chapter 10, he's still explaining what he said in chapter 6, verse uh, 6 or 5, where it says, and this will we do if God permit. Mm -hmm. Really what that says is, and we're going to move on from this because it pleases God. That's why all the way in chapter 10, it says, or chapter 11, faith pleases God. Nice. He's finishing up his expounding of chapter 6 all the way at the end of chapter 10. And once we get to chapter 10 and 11, we have completely forgot That's everything right. he said in chapter 6, and we act as if it has nothing to do with it. He's still breaking the thing open. Yeah. Faith pleases God. He's trying to get them to see, we're not doing this willy-nilly, guys. We're moving on because it's God's desire. Here's how we know it's God's desire. That old system, guess what? Could never bring you into the holiest place. Mm -hmm. Could it? No. They'd all be like, yeah, you're right. Only the high priest could come in once a year. That is the Holy Spirit thus speaking to us that the way into the holiest place had not yet been made manifest, which means there is a way into the holy place that will be made manifest. That's the system that pleases God. That's the system I'm trying to get you to move on to because that will bring you up into the holy place with boldness, with an unconcealed heart, with the full assurance of faith, and you can stand face to face with God, which is what he's always desired from the beginning, and that pleases God. If you're busy with the animal sacrifices, thinking you've got to be renewed every time you commit a sin, yeah. you'll never have your conscience purged from your sin and feel boldness in the presence of God. Right. But your conscience will always be reminded of your sin all of the time. And then you'll never feel confidence in the presence of God. You'll feel naked and ashamed. And so the author is like, let go of that. It doesn't please God. Mm -hmm. This system doesn't please God. And so the whole letter of Hebrews is about two systems. The faith and the law of Moses. Right. Faith, every time it's talked about in Hebrews, is not talking about our faith. No. It's talking about the faith. And he's comparing two systems, and he puts it side by side. And he says, let's look what this system does. Mm -hmm. Let's look at what this system does. Well, guess what? The law of Moses could never bring you into the holiest place because it could never completely purge your conscience from sin. But this system over here called faith that came in the person of Jesus, that has a once for all time sacrifice that can completely purge our conscience from sin forever. Yeah, because it came with a good word, you know, uh, the good word that we were pure to him from the beginning, but the other yeah. system never said that. It, it said, right. look at your sin, your, your wrongs. The reason why the other system can purge this once, once and for all is because it, it comes and tells us you've been perfect from the beginning. Yeah. See, once we hear that, it starts doing it. Faith starts yeah. working its way. That's why it's not really so much as if uh, that it go once some. I mean, yes, but um, it happens because you hear when you hear the truth when you once when you hear what Christ. I mean, the word that came through Christ about it happened in the beginning. You know, you yeah. were pure to him, and you were the apple of his eye. Since then, it's like okay, whoa. It's like well, so like you know, but now it's like it's no longer about okay the wrongs I'm doing. It's no longer yeah. it's like what the system of the other system was bringing. It's no longer about Okay, I have to go. I have to go. I have to go confess because it's no longer about the wrongs and the rights. Now you see, you've always been the, the righteousness of God. You've always been pure to Him. And it's like, oh, okay. Well, yeah. I don't know if you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, you got it. You begin, you got to, it. You begin yeah. to know yourself as you are. You're no longer looking through a glass darkly lit, but you're knowing yourself as you've always been known. And that's when you walk. That's when you're in the holiest place. In the, in our hearts, the moment. We really realize what God believes about us. It's a picture of us being in the holiest place. That whole right. temple thing, you can find a, a picture of that in our hearts. Like we're all face to face with right. God in reality, but in our hearts, right? We're experiencing that in our heart where we don't feel scrutinized by him, where we feel approved of by him, right. where we feel, you know, that we've been called his, mm -hmm. you know, that we're experiencing that in our heart and we're face to face. And so I just, that, that was some heavy verses. So I wanted to at least take some time for people to, to talk or ask the about process, yeah. those verses specifically. Yeah. Um, because I, you could say what's the truth, and that's great, but you also desire for people to understand why they're believing it's the truth. Yeah. You know, and I, I don't really know how, how well that came out. Um, you know, the, back, the word back, of God. Yeah, I do too. back when the author of Hebrews wrote that, it was you know, referring to people going back to the animal sacrifices. But if we take that today, 
Um, people will try to make up for their bad behavior by doing something, you know, by, um, you know, they have a fight with their husband and uh, they don't normally go out Saturday witnessing, but they're going to do it now because they want to please God. It's the, the, that same system is still very active today in the church, you know, trying to compensate. Right. She's going to church as a sacrifice. Yeah. Or you know, and that's how they look at it, most certainly. Yeah. <laughs> most certainly, that's how they look at it. Offer it up. But, you know, what's interesting is, and I think it's a really important part, particularly for, for folks when they're trying to understand what Scripture is saying, is the fact that you don't just take one chunk in isolation. I mean, you're writing a book. You don't write the book so that one sentence or a, a, a bunch, you know, a paragraph stands out as a standalone thing. You have something that brings it together from one end and it carries on through the end. If you write a long letter, you don't write the letter to be without the front, without, you know, the middle and the, and the ending. It all, it all yeah. ties together. But we take the Bible and we open it up and we go, well, here's the God verse right said. here. Boom. I'm just going to lay on that verse for a while and see what happens. And it, you get yourself all wrapped around the axle really badly, really badly. Yeah, I think that the, the, the greatest uh, misinterpretation of scripture is just picking it apart. Yeah. You know, you you have to read it as a whole. You have to have an understanding of it. As a whole. The whole council. The whole council. The whole right. council. It's like it's like if you would take a piece of artwork and only look at the bottom half. Yes. And then right. try to interpret the whole thing from the bottom half. But when you look at a piece of art, you're beholding the whole thing. And it's kind of like what the scripture is. It's a whole. The problem is there's a whole lot of pages in there. So it can be difficult for the human mind to behold the beginning and the end all at once. That's right. And so sometimes you can get lost. Mm -hmm. That's why the word was made flesh. So we can begin the only the scriptures through the word and Jesus. And then that makes it much easier to do. <laughs> That's right. That's right. You can't just look at the middle. <laughs> he's the whole beginning and the end. And he's, uh, he's the word. Like, you know, he's the whole. Like, That's right. Psalm 119 yeah. even okay. says it says that. Psalm 119, the Allah and the Mecca. The tap. Yes, right. The beginning and end of the law of God, the word of God, the faith of God. I mean, most people don't know that Psalm 119 is an acrostic psalm. Right. That means that there is, a, for each letter of the Hebrew alphabet, there's eight stanzas. So it begins with Aleph and it begins with Tap. The beginning and the end of the law of God, the word of God, the faith of God, the logic of God, the wisdom of God is contained in Aleph Tap. Now, Jesus come and called himself what? The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And so Jesus is declaring himself to be the beginning and the end of the law of God, the logic of God, the word of God, the wisdom of God, the, what, what, the, the thought of God. And that's why Paul come and said, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are contained in him. Yes. And that Psalm 9, 119 is actually telling us that. Hmm? It talks about the law of God being a, a light unto our feet and a lamp unto our way. Now, who's a light unto our feet or a lamp unto the way? The law of Moses or Jesus? Jesus. So what is one, Psalm 119 talking about? The law of Moses or Jesus? If we begin to see that, you know what happens? Our hearts will begin to inquire into this treasure chest of wisdom and knowledge that's contained in the Christ. That's one of the reasons why I hammer on Jesus as the law of God so much. Yeah. You know, and yeah. I'll get better at explaining to people why I'm doing what I'm doing because I realize they don't even need to know why I'm doing it because it'll happen whether they know why I'm doing it or not. But the reason why I do that is because something dynamic happens in the human heart when they can see what the law of God actually is and where it's actually contained. Their heart begins looking into a matter. Yeah. And then they begin seeing things that they never would have seen before. Because they're busy with this whole, well, the law of Moses, that's the law of God. The Old Testament, that's the law of Moses. As if there's some different thing. No, there's one law of God. It's always been Christ. It's never changed. It's never been the law of Moses. You know what's funny? When I was five or six, uh, we have a speech about uh, not taking parts of the scripture you know, in the law church, you know. And I remember my cousins were like making such a big deal. The Bible was open. I was walking by. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Look at that part of it. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I know what I know what God thinks about me. I continue to say I'm not the whole word of it, yeah. you know. 
that's uh, the council of it. That's uh, when you go to read it. That's I guess I'm what I'm saying is that's the whole of it. Like if yeah. you don't understand it, if you don't read a little bit of it, know uh, what this is, what the word just came about. I mean, what came the word that came through him that we are you know perfect and beautiful. So you're gonna read it. Go with that mindset, knowing. Listen, in the council of it, there, yeah. there, there, there is a written word of God, which is a great treasure to have. Yeah. But there's a living word of God that's a greater treasure to have. Amen. And and that's found in the one who resides in us. That's right. That we are, his word is in us. Yeah. Cindy and I were talking with Caleb and Danielle on Monday night about that very same thing. The fact that, that you have the written word, yeah. but the revelation of, of, of God is so much more than that and that that it that's truly what's opened up yeah. our relationship with at least sure. our relationship yeah. with god is is not just the word of god the written word right. but the revelation Absolutely. that's what's real of what's about. actually written there yeah. yeah yeah i mean otherwise it's like we're it's a book written in chinese yeah, pretty and much and none of us know how to read speak chinese and yet we're still reading it and telling people what it means yes <laughs> Seriously, I mean, imagine me opening up a book that's written in Chinese. I can't speak Chinese, and then I start telling you guys what the thing says. That's basically what's happened in the church with the Bible. And because you're the pastor, we're going to follow you and believe right. every word you said. That's right. We op- I op- we've been opening up the Bible. We got no idea how to read what's there, and then we try to tell people what's written. That's right. <laughs> I think one of the greatest blessings that uh, I encountered was when I really realized, when Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. When I, I mean, I read that for so many years, and I thought I knew, but I didn't know. In seeing Jesus, you won't see anything in the Father that's not manifest in the Son. And I always thought, you know, and you said it, that, you know, I thought that Jesus came to save us from the Father. (laughs) I mean, that's the way it's taught, man, you know. God was mad, and you know what? He had to take it out on his son because he really wanted to crush us like a bug, but he crushed his son instead. And so when I really came to realize that the Father, the Trinity, is as good as what Jesus was good, then now I have to interpret all scripture in the light of who Jesus Christ manifested God to be. That's it, the beginning and end of the word about God. He's the beginning and end of the word about God. God Mm -hmm. come and explain himself. And there is no revelation outside of his own explanation about himself. And that explanation was made flesh. So there could no longer be any confusion. And that's why Paul said in the past, God's winked at our ignorance. (laughs) Right? And he could see how we could be ignorant. But now he's come himself. And self-revealed. Be in front of all of us, and so he can't wink anymore, right? <laughs> now the only way, the only there is no I didn't know. Right. All shall know, right? And yeah. so those that know and then reject, right. man, what was then? And not because God's going to take lightning bolts and smite them, but because they judged themselves unworthy of eternal life. Paul said, Paul didn't say, well, now because you've rejected God, God's going to come and smite you. He said, well, because you've now judged yourself unworthy of eternal life. Let me now go to the Gentiles. Mm. Meaning they didn't want the life God came to give them. Right. Like God, God reaches out his hand, you know, I'm your father. Yeah. And they're like, no thanks. Yeah. Still doing it. <laughs> so I just wanted everybody to have a chance with, with Hebrews 6 to yeah. uh, voice so their thoughts and their, their, their grievances <laughs> with, with that. You know, and, and you can continue to believe that it is saying that if you want, you just won't be believing the truth. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Simple as that. And that's okay. <laughs> that's right. All right. Does anybody else have anything before we wrap it up and say Merry Christmas? Well, I just wanted to, uh, the scripture that came to my mind was the one in Romans, I believe it's in Romans, where it says that 
God has spoken to us in times past to our fathers through the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by and through a son. And what it says to me is, is that whatever question that I may have, I put it to that word. I put it to the faith that was found in Christ. So whatever the issue is in life, the answer, when we say Jesus is the answer, what we're actually saying is, is that he is the final word about any and every situation that we may encounter in our lives. And I just appreciate, I'll just keep saying this because of the message that Greg preached in August. I'm still on that message. What faith came, what work did faith come to perform? Because there's a scripture that says in Hebrews, by faith, we understand. And this is how understanding is coming because Jesus is that faith. And through us understanding that he is the word about our lives, the wisdom of God about our lives, the heart of God towards us in our lives. There's only one thing needful and it's found in Christ. That's where it all is. So I'm going to keep on staying on this message and milk everything I can milk out of that message because it is increasing revelation knowledge and is bringing so much joy and peace and hope and confidence in the Father. Yeah. Mm. We can approach him without, without any sense of inferiority because he's done it all for us in Jesus. So Amen. that's where I'm, where I'm at tonight. And well, Merry Gwen, Christmas. Gwen, it's like uh, when, when, when Jesus said, blessed are you for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but Amen. your father in heaven. Amen. Yeah. Man, I, I just see so much understanding coming through your heart, Gwen, because you've seen something about faith and what it is that can only just expound on the Godhead in your heart. And, man, you're going to see things that are just going to keep making your smile grow bigger and bigger. <laughs> your joy. Well, I, gonna... hope, I hope the smile don't get bigger because I got some teeth missing. <laughs> 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 Anyway, let, let me just say this. Don't be when, judging. When, like Anton that. <laughs> when, Anto when Antonio passed away, and you guys prayed for me, Greg, I don't know if you remembered, yeah, but I in your prayer, you talked about God giving that lady revelation on life and immortality. And I want to just testify to that word of declaration that was spoken out over me that it is coming to pass. Amen. It is coming to pass. So thank you. Thank you, Gwen. You're a blessing. Glory we God. love you. Amen. And Merry Amen. Christmas to you. Yeah. And Merry Christmas to everybody. Man. Right. We love you guys. Yeah. Merry Christmas. You can sit in here. That, and scripture, that scripture that she quoted was Hebrews 1. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. But listen, gang.